so now we're going to start for real. Before we get into any key scenes, I want to start by talking about Tennessee Williams' use of symbolism. They're plentiful throughout the play, sometimes a bit heavy-handed, but that's good for you guys because that means it'll be easy to make out. There's these overall symbols that are constant throughout the play, but I want to start with the names. Let's start with the main character, Chance Wayne. His first name, Chance, it indicates he's a risk taker, a gambler, figuratively speaking, not someone who follows the routine or conforms to normal standards. However, his last name is Wayne, so that means he's on the decline. If you think of Wayne like a wave, waxes and wanes, waxes means it approaches the shoreline, wane means it recedes away from. So when you put it together, it seems like his chances are no longer worth it. He's, he's not someone you want to take a chance on anymore because his reputation, his image, his popularity are all in the decline. Then you have the next main character who is Princess Cosmonopolis. Obviously not her real name. Her real name is Alexandra Del Lago. We're not even sure if that's her real name. That's probably a stage name, but let's begin with that, her stage name, Alexandra Del Lago. Alexandra comes from the male Alexander, and it typically connotes someone who's a savior or a great general or leader like Alexander the Great. So clearly her first name is supposed to be something important. The lago of the lake is really important because if you remember from our symbols early in the year, water is all about rejuvenation, about resurrection almost. And it's interesting because the play is set in Florida. And if you go back in history to the Spanish explorers and conquistadors of the 1500s, 1600s, they were looking for the Fountain of Youth. And some of them thought it was in Florida. So Alexander Del Lago's name is all about greatness, but a need to be reborn. Now the fake name, which we first encounter her with, is Princess Cosmonopolis. Cosmonopolis is completely made up, but it vaguely sounds Greek. Cosmos means city. So someone who is cosmopolitan is very sophisticated, elite, well-traveled. So she wants to come across that way. But instead of calling herself a queen, she's a princess. So clearly she wants to appear younger, even though she's middle-aged. So it's worth noting that she chooses a totally made-up name that still reflects something about her inner psyche and what's going on and troubling her. She wants to be appear younger, and then that connects to her real name, supposedly, the Lago, which is about rejuvenation. Then you have Heavenly, who is Chance's former girlfriend. That one's pretty obvious. Heavenly, a sense of redemption, a sense of paradise. Chance's last chance is to get back with Heavenly and somehow hopefully redeem himself that way. Boss Finley's Heavenly's father, boss. So he's not a mob boss. He's actually a politician, but there's a lot of corrupt elements to him and he wants to appear as the main power figure in this town and in the lives of the main characters. His son is Tom Jr. So Boss Finley is actually Thomas, um, but he's always referred to as Boss. His son being a junior means he wants to carry on the legacy of his father, but he's always kind of in the shadows of his father. He's junior too, subordinate to his father. So part of the play is Tom Jr. trying to become his own man. A lot of the religious connotations that you've noticed in Del Lago, Heavenly, also reflect in the name of the place, the setting of the play, which is St. Cloud. Not a real place, but it's supposed to be set in the Panhandle, maybe a couple hours from Tallahassee. And St. Cloud also obviously shows us a sense of being in the skies, of being in paradise, of being in heaven. And that's where Chance hopes to be able to win over Heavenly again and save himself in the process. So there are a lot of religious connotations, not only in the place and in some of the names, but on the day it's set. The whole play takes place on one day, Easter Sunday. So obviously that connects back to resurrection. On top of that, the hotel in which Chance and Princess are staying at is called the Royal Palms Hotel. And that also connects to Jesus' story because a week before his resurrection, he arrives in Jerusalem and he arrives on a donkey and he's celebrated by the townspeople of Jerusalem, so much so that they lay palm fronds on the ground for his donkey to walk over. Jesus is seen as so sacred 
that it's not right for his donkey to travel over dirt. So you can see that the hotel also has symbolic significance and the fact that it takes place on Sunday, we have to figure out as an audience, okay, who's trying to get redeemed and who will get redeemed by the end? And will there have to be sacrifices along the way? Like Jesus had to be a sacrificial lamb. There's also an effigy, but I don't want to get into that. We'll get into that later in the play. So let's start with our first key scene, which is an excerpt from Act 1, Scene 1, just the description of the setting. So notice that most of the setting, the staging of the play, is just projected. So it's a term that he came up with, a cyclorama, non-realistic projections. So if you remember from the background article you read, even though Tennessee Williams really focused on real problems, revealing people's issues with violence or sex or drugs, he often portrayed them in a slightly fantastical way. So the setting reveals that in that most of these are projections, what we project about ourselves to the world. The hotel itself not only has religious connotations, but it's also symbolic of what's going on with a lot of the characters in terms of aging versus wishing that they were young. So notice that it's called an old-fashioned but still fashionable hotel. So it still looks great, but it's no longer as popular as it used to be. And it seems like a relic from the past. Alexandra Del Lago, our princess cosmonopolis, definitely fits that description as well. She's still popular, people still admire her, but not as much as they used to when she was in the prime of her youth. Next, there's these large windows in the back that open up to a porch and you can see the ocean from there. Those reflect opening up to the soul. And whenever we see the characters approach the window or maybe close the blind on the window, it's definitely symbolic of them looking to the truth, looking to their past. And if they're closing it, it's because they don't want to dwell on the past. They don't want to dwell on the truth. They want to forget about it. There's also a door frame, but not an actual door, where we can see the hallway outside. And that's going to be important in some scenes. So to give you an idea, this is what the hotel might look like, although these are more modern pictures. So notice the Moorish arches and the wicker furniture, which would be really typical of Florida, especially in the era of the 1950s. And you have this sea in the background. They mention a tableau row. That's just like a little wicker table. And they also mention the Moorish lamp. So that's what it would look like there. All right, so let's get into some actual scene descriptions of our two characters, Chance and Princess, before we know too much about them. Notice that Chance is described as being already awake, so it's like he's more in the know right from the get-go of the play, and he's wearing white pajamas, whereas Princess breathes and tosses on the bed as if in the grip of a nightmare. So it's interesting he's just lying there or sitting up while she's lying there because you would think from the seemingly intimate nature of the setup, two people in bed, that they would be in a relationship and yet he seems not to care. She's caught in a nightmare and it's, that's definitely emblematic of how she feels in her life. Like she wants to wake up from a nightmare, which is the fading of her youth and the fading of her career, so she thinks. He's wearing white pajamas. White is going to be a symbolic color used throughout the play, not just for chance. And it's typically a cover-up, almost ironic, because they're not as pure as their clothing would let you appear. The next thing about chance is that he's lighting his first cigarette of the day. So the fact that William says his first obviously signifies he smokes a lot. And a lot of the characters use some kind of drug, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, even marijuana, to avoid their real life. So it's a coping mechanism, something that Tennessee Williams knew from his time in Hollywood and something he knew from his own life as well. Next, the first mention of the birds, soft, urgent cries of birds, the sound of their wings. Typically, the birds break through as a punctuation for some kind of regret, loss, feeling of anguish. Here, it's just a bit of foreshadowing of what's to come in the play. 
Our first dialogue between Chance and George Scudder tells us a lot, even as the audience is still kind of in the dark of what's really motivating some of these people. They couldn't be any more different. George Scudder is the norm that Chance ran away from in St. Cloud. He went to college. He became a doctor. He rose in the ranks of the hospital. So they even, they're dressed differently. Scudder in a suit, very professional. He has a doctor's bag. Chance is still in pajamas. The fact that Scudder opens his doctor's bag before he says, I'm, I'm chief of staff. I really feel that's symbolic of him trying to show his status. Look how important I've become while you, Chance, are a nobody. And then the fact that Chance asks about his mother and Scudder says, but that transition word clearly indicates that he doesn't think Chance cares as much for his mother as he would pretend to in the question. We, the audience, don't know who's right. Which of these men we are just getting to know them is right. We need to find out more details before we do. However, the fact Scudder says your mother died a couple of weeks ago, how the actor says that changes everything, the dramatic element. Does he say it with some sympathy or does he say it dry and matter of fact will definitely change the way we react to him. Speaking of reactions, Chance's reaction. Tennessee Williams says Chance slowly turns his back on the man and crosses to the window. Shadows of birds sweep the blind. He lowers it a little before he turns back to Scudder. This is just like what I was saying at the beginning of the scene when they were talking about the cyclorama and the floor length windows. He goes to the windows and he turns his back from George. He does not want George to see his real reaction. And he also needs a few minutes to compose himself because he might just lose it. The fact there's birds, now we don't hear them this time, we just see them. Typically the birds are some kind of symbol of anguish or pain. And then he lowers the blinds. He cannot face the truth right now. He cannot face the truth of his mother's passing, especially the fact that he was not there when his mother is passing. So a lot of symbolism here in the dramatic elements. The scene continues with Chance asking, well, why wasn't I told? And then Scudder goes on a long rant explaining, you were, we sent a wire, we sent a letter, and you never replied. We'll find out later it's that he wasn't in California. He wasn't in Los Angeles. He was actually in Palm Beach. But now the audience is thinking, well, maybe Scudder's right about his low opinion of Chance because how could he not be in contact with his mother? How could he have not left some kind of address in, his, in Los Angeles where people could reach him. And the fact Scudder says, I'm giving you these details in spite of the fact that I know and everyone here in town knows that you had no interest in her can seem horribly cruel. Or maybe there's some truth in it, in at least that he wasn't showing concern for his mother. And Chance sort of admits it. Yeah, she was sick when I laugh, left here last time. So if he knew she was sick, why didn't he make more of an attempt to reach out to her. We just don't know. So Scudder says it with really good figurative language. She was sick at heart as well as sick in her body at the time, Chance. So clearly her condition was physical, but the figurative connotation that she was sick at heart seems to imply that Chance was the cause of all of that. And this really seems to hit Chance because he can barely hide his emotions. He has to sit on the bed and put out his unfinished cigarette and his voice becomes thin and strained. Whereas before he turned his back so that George could not see his reaction, this time the news is too difficult and he has to actually sit down. And he's not even fully aware of his surroundings because his cigarette wasn't done and yet he put it on and started out a new one immediately. So it shows his coping mechanism and also it shows he's not totally processing what's going on.